Good morning. Check, check. Good morning. Is this on? All right, good, good, good. I'm your handsome host. I mean humble, <laughs> humble host. Same thing. Revolution Church, we're leading people where they are to where God wants them to be. And we're really excited. Kind of sad this series is ending, but kind of glad too because we get to baptisms next week. And we think we've got close to 20 people being baptized. I think you heard that. Yep. Isn't that good? Y'all like the worship band? They're pretty good, aren't they? Are y'all, are y'all groupies? I'm a groupie. All right, all right. Uh, we've been in uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, and for all the new people, and I'm sorry we're kind of running out of chairs. I'm kind of not sorry. That's awesome. So, uh, yeah, that's right. We've got some bleachers in the far back if they come in. We'll push those up too, all right? That's, are you serious? They are back there. I was just kidding. All right, I love it. If you're new to either church or Jesus or whatever, we're in this book called Nehemiah. It's about a guy, a pretty ordinary guy, and I just want to catch you up so you know where we're going. We'll hit it pretty fast. Is Nehemiah is just an ordinary guy. He's working as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Uh, he, he's just kind of a butler. He just, uh, he tastes food, he tastes wine to make sure the, the king doesn't get assassinated. And he's just minding his own business, okay? And, uh, but his brother comes to town and he says, you know what, uh, uh, I got to tell you something. He says, it's not going too good in Jerusalem. He, uh, Nehemiah asked him, he said, how's it going? He said, not good. It's pretty bad, actually. It's pretty embarrassing to God. The walls are crumbled all the way to the ground, and nobody knows what to do, and nobody can fix it. And he began to be, become overwhelmed. He fasted and prayed. God laid it on his heart to do something about Jerusalem, his hometown. And we couldn't as a church, as Revolution Church, ignore this story or proceed as a church body without going through the book of Nehemiah. We just had to do it because it sounds so much like our own story. And that is the West Gastonia. You, you probably know it. The walls are crumbled. So we feel that God's called us to task a lot like uh, he, he called Nehemiah to rebuild the walls because when the walls are rebuilt around a city like Jerusalem, it keeps it safe from enemy attack. But these walls are come to the ground and the gates are burned down. And so what Nehemiah does, he, he asked the king, he said, I need a lot of time off. I need all your resources. He got permission and blessings from the king, and he went to Jerusalem, about 800 miles away. It interrupted his life. And so when he got there, he assessed the damage, and it was as worse than what he thought. But he, he gave the speech of his life, and he told the people of Jerusalem, the, the people that were left, he said, look, I know this seems hopeless. I know it seems overwhelming, but God has called us to this. I know a lot of people have come to you before saying we're going to rebuild these walls. They hadn't been able to get it done for 140 years. But I believe God's equipped us and positioned us to rebuild these walls. Everybody got behind him. And what we know is, what we find out is, is that they rebuilt the wall. What took them 141 years of not doing, it took them 52 days to get that wall up. Amazing with the help of God. So we talked a lot about his opposition to that, to Nehemiah's opposition. But when you do great things for God, you're going to experience opposition. So that's where we are today. I hope that catches you up. And uh, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 6. And Josh promised me that will be on the screen for you. Now, uh, what we're doing today is we're, this is a very important day. There's not many days like this in a person's life. You know, there's only a, a kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing, like when you have a kid or you get married. And in this case, in Nehemiah's case, a wall's being built. He's about to finish what he started. And what we're talking about today is finishing strong. Finishing strong. So a lot of people in our church has not just looked at this as a story in the Bible that's so uh, out of relevance in their life, but hey, God is attempting by maybe drawing me to this church or another church or drawing me to God that he wants to repair my walls. And he wants you to look at people around you to help rebuild their walls. So that's kind of the context we're looking at this. And we're in Nehemiah chapter 6, and I'm just going to start reading. And, and, and today's going to be a little different. It's going to have a little soap opera twist, a little, little Montel Williams or Jerry, Jerry Springer action. And you'll see that pop up a little later. Uh, but in Nehemiah chapter 6, and I, I, I like soap operas. I'm, I'm, not, I'm pretty manly looking, and I am. I got the beard. I've got a little bit of hair on my back. But my grandmother, when I, I grew four streets over, grew up four streets over, and my grandmother watched me after school, and she lived with us, and she loved her programs, is what they called them, and some, we've got all range in here, so you might know some of your little experienced adults, you remember the guiding light, and I shouldn't know all the characters of the guiding light, but the Spaldings and Reba and all those people, I knew them, I knew them, so I watched them, 
and it was always some kind of drama going on. And so I just, you know, it just kind of sucks you in. So we got a little bit of that going on today. In Nehemiah chapter 6, I'm going to read a little bit, and we're going to talk a little bit, and we'll read some more. And we're going to, I hope you'll pull this out of you, just how this uh, may apply to your life. Here we go. <clears throat> when word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and for all you new people, these are bad guys. These are not friendly people. They're against what Nehemiah's doing. And the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it. I mean, he had that sucker built up. They had worked really hard and all of the walls were completed. It says not a gap was left in it. Though up to that time, listen, I had not set the doors in the gates. And what Nehemiah is telling us is, I'm almost finished, but not quite. I'm almost finished, but not quite. So what we're going to learn today, this is kind of the principle. This is what I want to hang your hat on. This is what I want to take home with you, try to memorize it, whatever, is this. The closer you get to what God wants done, the harder the enemy works to stop you. That's just what he does. We don't want that to be some kind of secret. We don't want you to, to lull you into thinking that the opposition doesn't hate your guts for doing something for God. So, one thing we learned last week and the last few weeks is that we don't experience opposition for doing something wrong. We experience spiritual opposition when we do something right. You're going to find that. So, for some people in this series so far, I hear stories, they tell me, they confide in me, and I keep them secret. And you're telling me how you're working towards God. God's moving you to do something, to rebuild the walls in your life. He's calling you to do for different things. And you're so close to either starting it or accomplishing it. Then there's resistance. Because a lot of you, you finally decided the importance and said, man, I, I need spiritual nourishment. I need for God to pour into me. I need to really grab a hold of this opportunity. And so you decided to, to, to sign up for a life group. And you take that step, and man, you're on your way, maybe to even go, and your kid throws up all in the car. You know, you're almost there, but there's some kind of obstacle. We've got to pay attention to those. It's not always people. It's our spiritual enemy. And then I started thinking, there's a lot of people in here that says, you know what, they've decided that, you know, I've been married for X number of years, and Jesus just hadn't been in the center of that. It hasn't been a Christ-centered marriage, and I, we want to do that right now. This is the opportunity to do that. And you take that chance, and you start to come, and on the way to church, man, just the arguments go on, and all hell breaks loose, and you are almost there. That's why I take separate cars, I'll just be honest with you, you know, just to make sure that doesn't happen, because when me and Holly argue, and she's right, I just don't like to come and stand on stage and talk, you know what I mean? Just take separate cars. I'm just kidding, that doesn't happen in this church, it happens to all the others I heard, but, but you know, I, I think of people saying, you know, I want to... I want to do that. I want to make Christ the center. You start to take those steps and experience opposition. And there's some of them, and you decided that you're, man, I'm realizing that my body is a holy temple. It is the temple of God. And you want to do something about it. Okay, maybe you have done something. You're working hard, and man, you're 10, way, 10 pounds away from your, your goal. And then you go to buy low, and you're pushing around, and little Debbies are buy one, get 50 free. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I hate that. Because I got a lot of temple. So anyway, sorry. Sorry. Especially Swiss rolls, right? We got any Swiss roll fans? That's me. I'm a sucker. But what you find out is, you know, I'm almost there. Almost there. And then opposition happens. Happens to you. And so today, we're going to find out just what the enemy does. That what he does to distract you. He's going to do a couple things to take you off the wall, to get you to stop working on what he's called you to do. And here's what I know. So many people that, some, some of you are testing the waters, you're dipping your toes in, you're, you're checking things out, that's awesome. Maybe you're healing from another place that burned you. Maybe that, maybe just you've, you've been off track for a while, but you're here, and you're just trying to re rest in what the God's got for your day, maybe through worship, maybe through a word, that's cool. But let me let you know, there's a lot of people here that have committed to something, committed to building this wall. And what we are suckers for is we're always drawn to comfort, aren't we? And so we're doing so well, and it's all God, but he wants this thing so bad. And we've got people working on the walls of this west side of Gastonia. They're working really hard. But here's what Scripture tells us is that, you know what, there's going to be all kind of distractions that your spiritual enemy is going to place in front of you to pull you off that wall. 
It's really slick, really slick to pull this off the wall. So number one, one of those ways, two of, we're going to talk about two of the ways, but the way your enemy will try to uh, get you off the wall is to distract you. So as you're moving forward and, and God wants you to do, what, what God wants you to do, we see in verse 2 this. Sam Ballot and Geshem sent me this message. Come meet with us. Let's meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. It's like Yoko. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. But they were scheming to harm me. Here's what they're saying. First, everybody say, oh, no. All right? Oh, no. All right? All right. Here's what the enemy's saying. You know, we see all this progress. We see God doing amazing things through these people. And these people be really dedicated to what God's called them to do. I think that God's called us to, to plant this church and to affect this community. He's also doing things individually in your life. He's calling you to do something, to make some moves in your family, to repair your walls. But here's what the enemy's saying. We've got to do whatever we can to get him off the wall. Whatever we can to get him off the wall. And here's what I figured out. I just kind of reflected in my own life, just to let you in, is when you start moving towards what God wants you to do, it's, it's not the big things. Did I just spit? Some of y'all like taking a bath. Okay. It's not the big things. Some of y'all are so smart, man. You're so smart. You know it's not the big things that's going to take you all. But what I've noticed is it's the little things over time that turn out to be the biggest distractions that take you off the wall. Uh, and I started thinking about this in my own life. And, and just a couple scenarios I was looking at is about not, I guess last spring, uh, Rachel's my youngest. She loves to make memories. She'll talk about it, make memories. And her older sister was gone to something, whatever she was gone to. She said, I'm going to go fishing. So we pulled out the fishing stuff and got all the stuff. It's kind of a hassle. But we wanted to make a memory. And so we went to the store and bought the, the little worms in the can or whatever you get them, you know. And so we went fishing. Man, I wanted to catch a fish so bad. It's going to be a, something we'd probably talk about for years, something, something where we're just developing our relationship more and more. And I just took the day off and we just spent it together. And so when we got to the place where we fish, and it looked great. It looked great. Uh, it was still kind of early. Shadows over this deep-looking part. I thought, man, if we can cast right there, she'll catch a big, huge fish. This will be awesome. So we made a little uh, campsite there just for us to spend a couple hours. And, man, I swear, these, and I think it was just one, this mosquito, this <laughs> terrorist mosquito just haunted us and harassed us. The whole time. Thought, what is that? I kept getting big whelps on me. And I thought, gosh, this is, that hurt. <laughs> and so Rachel's loving it. And she's, you know, and finally I looked over at her. And, and she looked up at me. And she had these whelps, like big cartoon knots. You know what I'm talking about? All over. And, and she's just looking at me. I thought, oh, mama's going to kill me. Man, and I, I'm telling you, I would, I would love to kill that thing. I probably would have sprained my wrist trying to hit this. It was like a helicopter, right? <laughs> but that little, although it was big, it was still little, it literally made us pack our stuff up and go. We missed out on so much because of this little distraction. And that's what I've, I've found to be the case, that a lot of times it's the small things that turn into the big distraction. What about Facebook, right? Facebook? My great-great-grandma's got Facebook. I mean, everybody's got it. And you know, you know what I'm talking about. You just want to spend a minute just to check and see what, what so and so's doing and see who sent you a message. But that minute turns into three and a half hours sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> Holly, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was just kidding. I was just kidding. Holly doesn't even, yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. So it's sometimes the little distractions, right? I was going to say not Holly, but some of y'all other ones, like you, you're on Facebook so long, you come back, and it's like a time capsule, and your kid's are like, who's that woman? Your kid's like grow up four years old. Anyway, but not Holly. So maybe it's not the, you know, big things, but it's the little things over time that add up. And I see people, listen, I see people, man, they really do. They've got sick kids. Gosh, I'm a parent, I know. I'm, I'm the first one to be sympathetic. They've got sick kids. It's always an obstacle. You know, then this happens, and that happens. And man, sometimes there's little distractions over time. And I got one here. <laughs> sometimes maybe it's the good things that distract you from the great things. You like that? Sometimes it's the good things that distract you from the great things. And I started thinking about it. There's some good stuff out there, you know. And some of you, man, you're, you're, you're 
well known out there and, and maybe you, you know a lot of people and people are constantly asking you to do stuff. That's awesome. Maybe to be on a board, maybe to be a part of a club, maybe to go on a trip. Those are, those are good things. Man, you need to get involved in things. But listen, when, when God's called you to do something, sometimes the good things get in the way of the great things. It takes you away. And so I started thinking of some that might apply, formally apply to me. I had to, you just gave yourself a spanking. I started thinking about football. I love football. I love to play football, watch it. I love it. Go Seminoles. But um, what I noticed about our men, and, and I started, let's put it in perspective for me, is that we spend sometimes our, our best, the best part of our weekend watching 20 to 30 year old men in tight pants. That just don't sound right. You know what I'm saying? I can't see y'all. Yeah, y'all are out there. Who said amen? Amen, a woman, whatever. Yes, it distracts us, doesn't it? It's like, oh, well, if that's the case, I'm, I'm going to back off of some of that because I, I don't necessarily like watching that. But I love football. There's nothing wrong with it. But the, the same thing I was telling myself is, you know, when you say yes to something, my wife taught me this. When you, listen, when you say yes to something, a lot of times you're saying no to something else, right? Some of y'all are trying to be dads. God's called you to be a father. God's called you to be a husband. He's given you a wife. He's given you the gift of a wife, the gift of children. He's at least called you to be those things. And I know, I, most of the guys I know, they want to be good dads. They want to be good husbands. They want to be, women want to be good wives. I think people want to serve God. But they let good things get in the way of great things. Y'all follow me yet? Yeah. Let's make sure you're out there. Okay. Uh, so you've got to be careful just not to let to be distracted by that. So, and so when we're on the wall, I want to tell you something. It's kind of corny. I want you to work with me because I'm always trying something new. I want you to try this because Nehemiah said it. So when you're on the wall, whatever you do, you're trying to plant this church and make it effective and reach for God, trying to be a great husband, trying to lose weight, trying to plant a business, trying to look. You're trying to lead a life group. Listen, there's going to be distractions to that. And here's what I want you to say as a church, after I say it, I'm not coming down. Say it one time. That was kind of convincing. Really make it convincing. Uh, and, and maybe you have to growl a little bit to really push it out and have some attitude. I'm not coming down. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. And I want you to read this in verse 3. Here's what Nehemiah said. So in response to them saying, hey, come down, come off the wall, come all the way out here in the field of Ono, Come out here and let's me. Let's talk about this. What are we going to do to get you off the wall? Here's his response. So I sent messengers to him. He didn't even go himself. I sent me messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project. Listen, I'm saying this loud because it's the main thing of all day long. And I want you to catch it. So let me gargle. Here's what he says. I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. I'm not coming off the wall. Why should I stop work while I, have, while I leave it and go down to you? And it says, four times they sent this same message to me. They were persistent. And each time I gave them the same answer. Come off the wall. Stop what you're doing. Here's stupid things. Here's good things that you could come off the wall to do. Right? Come down. And he says, I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. This is what he's saying. He said, what I'm doing right now in this season of my life is very important. And I'm not saying what you're asking me to do is not important. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm carrying on a great work and I, a great project and I can't come down. I can't do it. And so, and here's what we got to know is that even when the opportunity is good, that we have the courage to say no. We've got to be able to say no to things. Because God's going to call you to awesome things. I'm already seeing it. It's already happening here. And so I've got a few good examples of this. I want to talk a little bit about this. Here's what we do. I, I started thinking about some, 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 some things that we do that we're great examples of what we do good at a young age of a church. What we're good at. This was pretty long. And here's what we were good at. We're good at reproducing and bringing up leaders. We've got people that are realizing that God wants to use them. But those people had to say no to a lot of good stuff so they could work on something great. 
And so we're developing leaders here. Another thing is we're good at, we're good at managing money. We do a whole lot with a little bit. We've got generous people, but we're still a young church. But we get a whole lot done. That's something, some good stuff that we get done. Another thing is we're good at giving stuff away, right? We're good at that. We, we enjoy doing that the best that we can. We feel like we're called to do it. Another thing we're good at is showing grace and authenticity, authenticity to people that have come in. I feel like that's what people need and want and are looking for that's absent in so many other areas of their life. And so I think they're just relieved that they can come in and say, hey, I've been to rehab. Awesome. We want to celebrate. That's awesome, man. That's great. That's the kind of church this is. We're good at that. Another thing we're good at is taking the Bible and bringing it to a level that people who didn't grow up in church can actually have an encounter with Jesus. Right? That's what we try to do here. I think we're excellent at that. We're really good at that. But sometimes we get ideas. Listen. We get ideas. People, it's just how it is. When you plant a church or involve in church, people have ideas. Some of them are good ideas. We should have an exercise, Christian exercise thing, and we'll play Amy Grant, and we'll just exercise Amy It's not... It's not, it's not a bad idea. But listen, although it's a good idea, it will dis- distract. Listen, we have to guard this vision we've got, leading people from where they are where God wants them to be and focusing on the lost. And people will come in with, most of them, good ideas with good intention that will take us off that wall. Listen, here's one. I, I love sports. I grew up on it. It kept me alive. It gave me a purpose to live, all that stuff. I've been through that. And I love it. Kids, if you're kids, I love it. And there's, there's ministries in Gastonia that thrive off of this, and it's awesome. So it's a good idea. But I feel like at this season of our life as a church, he hasn't called us to necessarily have softball teams and basketball teams. and You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes that can distract. It's a good thing. That's fun. Probably fellowship. But it pulls us off the wall sometimes. We've got to guard against that. And there's good things that will come along. And in, instead of having a Christian... Uh, uh, work out, Amy Grant. Hey, how about you join the Y? How about you join Planet Fitness or wherever it is you go and live out Christ in those moments and draw people to Him? I feel like that's much better. That's kind of the way we do things. That's what we're looking at, right? Yes, yeah, that's, that's clap worthy. Because here's the deal there's a lot of other examples. People come in, I, it's a great idea. It's a good idea, but man, we've got to stay focused on this. We don't want to come off the wall. Right? And here's what I love. I love my wife's kind of starting to embrace this. It's because she's a good woman. I'm, I'm stacking it up, ain't I? She's a good woman. I'm going to say this clearly. Here's what she does. She works full time. She's got two kids. She raises. Okay? She started a ministry several years ago for teenage girls. Unbound ministry. It's successful. We have a it's come under our church, and we had a very successful thing right when we planted. It was awesome. Our volunteers really stepped up. So she runs that. She mentors several people. I don't know how many. She's speaking next weekend at this thing. Here's what God, I think, is laying on her lap now. Is that sometimes she's got to mean it from her heart to say no to some things. All those, those are all great things, and, and people constantly are asking her to do more, and she loves it. She just does this. It's not out of bad intention that she says, yes, it's good. She feels equipped, but sometimes, look, just because you could do something doesn't mean you should. Don't let it take you off the wall, right? So, what I, I, I think she'll be saying and has said is, you know what? What you're asking me to do is great and a good thing, but at this season of my life, I'm working on a very important project. Hey, even just making sure uh, I'm happy is a full-time job. I'm doing this. I have to do it great, and I can't be pulled off the wall, right? That's her life. And I start thinking about your life and, and what's going on out there. I, I, I work full-time. I've got kids. I totally relate. I totally relate to those things. I started thinking, you know, some people's got maybe raising three kids. Maybe somebody needs to tell you that three, raising three kids is a great work embrace this season in your life look God's given you a gift of kids let's not neglect them for other things for good things 
That's a great project. Somebody needs to tell you that. Some people in here, they're, they're trying to start new business. They're trying to become life group leaders. God's called them to do that. And I know what they're going to get hit with. God says, I want you to build this business. I want you to become uh, more involved at, at, at church. I want you to be, become a volunteer in a certain area. Take this on. God's called you to do that. And then good things like softball. Hey, come play softball. With us. Let's go on this hunting trip. Come off the wall. Those are great things. But you're, you're in the process of building a wall. He's called you to be a parent, a husband. All of those things. We've got to learn to say no. Got it? I'm beating a dead horse here, but, so, but the first thing you've got to know is the enemy's going to try to distract you. And here's the other thing the enemy's going to do. He's going to try to discredit you. He's going to try to discredit you. And the first way he does this is by spreading rumors. And you've got to know this. If you're going to do anything significant for God, any bold moves, people are going to talk about you. They're going to misinterpret your motives. They're going to twist what you think and say. It just goes with it. I had to nail that down before we did this. I knew that they would come out of the woodwork. The Lord's keeping me protected pretty good. But that's, that's just what happens. So check this out. Then, is this verse 5? Yeah, then the fifth time that Sam Ballot sent his aide, he had a little personal assistant, kind of like Sally, okay? He had a little personal assistant. Sent his personal assistant with an unsealed letter in which was written, and what an unsealed, listen, this is going to spread some rumors here. This is what an unsealed letter. If it was a sealed letter, the king would put his imprint on it, and only the person that it was addressed to could open and read. And it's between you and the king. You and somebody. But this is an unsealed letter. That means we want everybody to read this so they can twist it up. We're going to start gossiping. What's going on at that church? You know, what's going on in their lives? That's what's going to happen. So, and here's what it said. This is a quote. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem, which is a bad guy, he says it's true that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt. That's what this whole thing's about. You're going to revolt against the king, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, are about to become their. Let's see, you are about to become their king, and haven't and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is, a, uh, there is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. They're lying. This is a lie. They're spreading rumors. There's no truth to this. Because when we look back at, at I love to look back at uh, chapters before we read it, in Nehemiah chapter 5, we, last week we got a great idea of what, what Nehemiah's heart really was. He was uh, a sacrificial leader. He was going to bat for the uh, uh, people that were down and out. He was trying to get their debt canceled. He was giving them their own food. He was being generous. He's being anything but what they're painting him to be. So it was exactly the opposite. Now we've got to see how, re how Nehemiah responds because, look, you don't face opposition for doing something wrong. You face spiritual opposition for when you do something right. So we're going to see how Nehemiah responds here in verses 8 and 9. Here's what he said. Because we've got to learn how to respond. We've got to be able to do this. He said, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making this stuff up. You're making it up in your head. And what he knew was, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will be too weak for work, and it will not be completed. He said, but I prayed, now strengthen my hands. He's praying to God, strengthen my hands. And I want you, he kept it real simple. And take this home. When you run into opposition, it says his response was simple. Look, first he said, it's not true. It's not true. He prayed, and then he got back to work. That's what he did. Not true. What you're saying is not true. He prayed, and he got back to work. So people aren't going to understand you when you make these moves for God, when you're doing something that God's called you to do, either with this church or you individually in your life. They're not going to understand it. They're going to talk about you. You just say, not true. You're going to pray and get back to work. That's what it is. It get back to work. I don't want anybody, what anybody says to you or, or, or that would make you come off the wall. 
Don't let anything that other people say about you being obedient to God, because what they're only satisfied with is when you stop being obedient to God. Okay? I know the worship team's coming up, but I got one more point. I know. The second thing your enemy is going to do to discredit you is to tempt you to compromise. That's what he's going to do. And you might be trying to jot that down in the dark. He's going to tempt you to compromise. He's so good at this. We're about to inter- be introduced to a new character, Shemaiah. It's a pretty cool name. Shemaiah, but not after this. And this is kind of the soap opera part I was telling you about. This is it. Verse 10. One day, a different day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and son of Mehetepeleba. That, that sounds like I know what I was talking about. Who was shut in at his home. And this is what he said. Let us meet, Nehemiah, let us meet in the house of God. Let's go to the house of God, this temple, and go inside the temple. And we're going to close the door behind us. And, and, and because these men are coming to kill you, okay, I'm keeping you safe. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the house of God. And what we know, and we kind of don't know this, but we can just kind of assume it, that Shemaiah was most likely a temple priest. That's people kind of take care of the temple, make sure it's you know, running smooth and things like that. Because he had access to it. That's why we think that. It doesn't say it. But here's the deal with going in the temple. You can't just walk in there. It's for high priests. Okay? It's blasphemy to go inside of there. Okay? People's going to talk. It's like getting caught going in a leather and lace. You know what I'm Some of y'all are like, whoa. You know, you just, certain places you aren't allowed. And this is the holy kind where God said, I mean, it, they're, they're saying, God, only the priest can go in there. You can't be seen going in there. It will ruin your name. The other thing is God might strike you down is what they thought. So only, only the priest could go. But he's saying, let's go in there and we'll shut the doors. And what he's trying to do is set him up here. He's trying to set him up here so that it would discredit him. And I'll read the rest of this. Verse 11, but I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? He says, I will not go. I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him to me, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. They paid him off. He had been hired to intimidate me, to say, you know, they're going to kill you. So, So that I would commit a sin by doing this. And when they would give me a bad name to what? Discredit me. To discredit me. It's in there. That's where I got it. I didn't make that that tagline up. You know, it would have been easy for Nehemiah to take him up on that. Because, listen, when you start increasing your effectiveness, doing what God's called you to do, he's going to stack it on you. It makes you actually makes you more vulnerable to this. You, you can start to get the big head. Hey, this helps me. We start gaining influence. We start to feel entitled. And man, we start to compromise. You see preachers go down all the time. You see men of God go down all the time. For this very reason to compromise. He's coming after you. Go back to verse 11. But I said, should a man like me run away from this wall? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save save his life? I will not go. What he's saying is I'm not going to give up. I came here to build a wall, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to stop until it's built. God's called me into this marriage. He's called me to be a parent. He's called me to do these things. I'm not going to walk away from that. I'm not going to be distracted or discredited. So here's what he says. Two things. I'm not coming down off the wall. I'm not going to give up. There's not quit in me. Because the same spirit that lived in Jesus to raise him from the dead lives in us. Did y'all hear that? Okay. So I want to tell you the end of the story. What happens? What's the end of the story? 
is he built a wall in 52 days. In verse 16, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations, everyone around, were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. With the help of our God. Here's what I'm excited about right now. I feel like I always come in with anticipation that somebody's about to step across that line. They're about to make a decision to follow Jesus. They're seeing God make a pull into their life and drawing them to Him. And I want you to stand out. I just want to talk about that for a second. If you can stand quietly. Let me say it like this, because I believe it. Listen, nobody moving around. What the theme I constantly see in God's Word is He's absolutely in love with you. And He's drawing you to Him. He wants to change your life. He wants to save your life. He wants to make it new. I feel like that some of you are just a step away from making a significant decision in your life. And some of you are already there. I wish you'd close your eyes because I'm about to ask a question. Some of you have really tried to move forward. But you found resistance in your marriage, relationships, career, job. Hitting a lot of speed bumps. And for some of you, it's brick walls. You want to do something for God. You're trying to do something for God. But you're experiencing opposition and resistance. Would you raise your hand so I can pray with you? Mine's up. Yes, me too. All over. You can put them down. I'm going to pray for that. Let me pray for that. Father, we are overwhelmed with your growth, God, that you've given us, God. We can only give you credit for. But God, we don't want to leave people behind, God, that are hurting and aching. God, they need hope in their life that can only be, that can only come from you. God, help us to slow down and help people with their wall. Help restore people, God. For all their circumstances in their life, Lord, that seem hopeless and helpless, God, that they'll stay on the wall, that they won't be derailed, they won't give in to discouragement. God, but they'll grasp the truth, Lord, that that you are their hope, Lord, and you want to rescue them, Lord, so that you can get glory. There's a lot of other people here. Of course, you, this might be your day. This might be your day, the most important day of your life, where you give your life to Christ, that you'll surrender that to Him, all areas. And listen, I don't want you to insult the grace of God just by asking Him to rescue you, but listen, ask Him to be Lord of every area of your life, every single one. He loves you, and you have a, re- a chance to respond to Him today. See, sin separates us from God, and He's so mad about sin that does that. He wants to be in fellowship with you. And God knew that. That's why He sent Jesus, and Jesus went to a cross if you hadn't heard, and He experienced the a criminal's death is a sacrifice for our sins so that we can have life. We can have it not just forever, but abundantly while we're still here. And one thing I love about this church is just how much the people here embrace people that take those steps. And they reflect the celebration that, that God has for when you take that step. I never embarrass people in situations like this. I just want to know if I can pray for you. Much like the ones before, if you'd show me your hand and lift your arm, I'd love to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't fake me out. Let's pray. Father, four people just crossed the line, God, from life to death. Because of your word, because of our worship of you, 
people now have a life, Lord. It's secured in you. They're going to take steps, God, towards you. They felt your love and your pull to them, God. God, thank you for saving us, God. And not just saving us, Lord, but giving us a, a purpose and a plan, God, that we can move forward from this decision, Lord, of giving our life fully and wholly to you, God, and surrender. And God, you're going to have us move and take more steps, God. And God, we're learning as a church, Lord, that we're going to experience opposition. But God, I thank you for a church, Lord, that, that believes in community, Lord, that we can support each other, God, and we can encourage each other, God, that we can take those steps with confidence. God, that we have people around us that remind us, Lord, of the decision we've made and the love you have for us. God, I thank you for those decisions today. Amen. Can you clap for those guys? Is that something? Now listen, next week is huge huge we figured people would give their life to Christ today we expect that we're not surprised by that we like it we love it we want some more of it that's a country song which means it must be right and we've got a table over here okay and what we want you to do if you gave your life to Christ today is one of the thousand reasons you can go over there is to sign up for baptism next week it's in the baby pool, so if you can't swim, that's cool. I won't, we won't hold you under long. But listen, we want to just celebrate you. And listen, that next step I was talking about, that's it. That's your next step. It's to be baptized. Jesus did it. He called us to do it. Be obedient. Right off the bat, just be obedient. Some of you have already made that decision. You've already done that. But maybe you need people around you that are for you and not against you that will encourage you and, and walk beside you. We have something for that. We pulled it straight out of the Bible. Okay? We're just trying to copy what the Bible says. That's all we're doing. And you need to be involved in a life group. Some of you used to call it Sunday school. It's Sunday school on every day of the week. We want you to sign up. I'm going to put you in the right one where you will grow and develop and mature as a follower. If you're like, man, what's this church about? What do they believe? We got something called starting point. It's like people need to know what we're about. They need some people just need to know the basics of Christianity. And we got the best person that we could put in that spot over the starting point. And it, it's got that life group feel, except for it's hit, held here at the Y. And we're just gonna walk through it. It's awesome. I'll do it. I'll do it again. I love it. Some of you need to volunteer. You've been a spectator all your life or for a long time if we're going to reach more people we need more people volunteering to commit your Sunday morning something that you're doing and all through the week there's opportunities if, if that's a bad day for you we don't want to shame and guilt you and we just know it's necessary if you're going to follow Jesus it's just what you got to do and that's where people are like why are you growing it takes four years to get to 200 people that's true. Four years to get to 200 people. One of the reasons, and it's all to God's credit, is they said, we've got to plug in life groups. I want to serve. God calls to serve. That's how, we, that's how we prove to people we love them is when we serve them. It's really hard to call yourself a follower if you're not doing those things. But listen, I want you to walk away from this. God's call, at least in this season of your life, He's called you to do something. What is it? What is it? And now that you've got a vigilant eye, you've got scripture, we've read God's word. He says, look out for these type of distractions that will pull you off the wall. They'll be good things, really good things. You'll have to learn to say no for the great things. Y'all believe that? Let's clap because it's God's word. I love that. Now's an opportunity to listen. Some of you gave your life to Christ. Here's, here's another step. Man, you can start singing. We're just going to sing to God and about God. And some of you are going to be doing different things other than leaving.
God wants to see us worship. He created us and built us and molded us so that we would worship Him. That's His worship. Give it to Him in whatever way God calls you to do. And I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to pray about some few things for myself and my family, things I've got to say no to, things I've got to refocus to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to be available to help you with yours. And there'll be other people here to help you with yours. Don't freak out if you see people coming down here to pray or kneeling down to their seat to pray. Don't freak out. You just focus on God. Talk to Him. That's how we communicate to God. He communicates to us through His Word and through prayer. I love all the visitors. I'm going to try to make my way over there in a little bit and say hey to you. If you need me, I'll be right over here and waiting on you. Okay? God, this worship is yours. Thank you for the day. Amen.